files. Making so many videos, it's not even funny. Um, I just got on a video kick and I have a lot of ideas, so I'm going to, yeah, make a video. There you go. <laughs> you guys like my shirt? It is what is your name? Cookie Monster. Cookie Monster in the nerd glasses. And this is one of my favorite shirts. I have a shirt. I have a Perry the Platypus shirt and sometimes I get it mixed up like I pulled out one the other day and I put it on thinking it was this shirt <laughs> and it was just Perry the Platypus so I was like oh that's not the shirt I wanted to wear but <laughs> well. In my last video I kind of briefly, very, very briefly said that I was rereading the Nancy Drew series and that sparked an idea to make another video um, because there's a lot of stuff you don't know about the Nancy Drew series. I am on book number three and it's the bungalow mystery and this actually I got at the library. Where else? It's the original cover as it appeared in the 1930s and it is the unedited version and it is pretty good. It's I, I'm enjoying it. Hold on a second, my mommy texted me. A long time ago, my mom, oh gosh, she bought this book for me and it is uh, The Lost Files of Nancy Drew. And I had been reading them uh, and my mom, I, I think I kind of, I think we might have been at Books A Million and I was like, Mommy, I have to get it. So she got it for me. And it's, it's a really cool book. It's got all kinds of things like this in it, and it, you, you can pull stuff out, and it, you know, it opens, and it's kind of like a giant pop-up book. It doesn't have all of them, because obviously that'd be way too many, um, but it starts with, you know, the very, very first Nancy Drew book with The Secret of the Old Clock, and it ends with... It's with? And it ends with <laughs> The Thirteenth Pearl. There is a part in the back um, that tells a little bit about the his- Oh god, that hurt. <laughs> tells a little bit about the different evolution of the books and who wrote them and, you know, kind of stuff like that. Oh, and there's also like a bajillion of these postcards that they put in the back that has all of the covers. Obviously, I'm never going to send these because these are awesome. And who sends postcards anymore? Nobody? The Nancy Drew series is kind of, it's very interesting because during that time period, it they were originally written in 1930. Uh, the first couple of books were written in the 1930s. And that was right around the time where the suffragette movement was starting and, you know, a lot of things were changing for women. So the fact that this book exists in that time period was quite unusual because Nancy Drew was a female heroine. Like, that just wasn't a thing back then. And she, especially because she was a detective too, like there was no such thing as women detectives. So the books uh, were the idea of a man, actually. His name was Edward Strat Stratemeyer, I think. He was a German uh, immigrant, and he had this idea to of uh, these stories, and it was originally with Nancy, um, but before that he wrote the Hardy Boys, and then he just kind of got into um, finally making Nancy Drew a thing. When he had done the Hardy Boys, he just went to his publisher and said, Hey, this is like the late, late 1920s. And he went to his publisher and said, Hey, I have this idea for a detective. Uh, she's a girl. And, um, you know, what do you think? So it was interesting. He had trusted the idea to a woman named Mildred A. Wirt. W-I-R-T, Wirt, I think it is. How you say it. I am so bad at pronouncing names. He entrusted the story to her so, you know, she could write it kind of in the guise of, I mean, she was a woman, so I mean, <laughs> it would make more sense for her to write about a, in a woman's perspective. They kind of both came up with this pseudonym, Carol King, which is Keen. King. Carol Keen. Which is on the book. Yeah, which is on all of the, pretty much all of the Nancy Drew books until, um, they stopped writing for her. So this kind of sucks. <laughs> A couple of weeks after the publication of Nancy Drew, Stratmire died of pneumonia. <laughs> so he had this idea for Nancy for so long and then right as she launches, he dies. Like, that is... 
That is every author's worst nightmare, I swear. So Strattenmeyer's daughters actually took over the syndicate for him, and they were the ones who basically got it going. So multiple writers actually wrote for Nancy Drew. It was mostly the daughters and Mildred. Mildred would help, and but a lot of the the daughters were very involved in the book writing process, and they are the ones who gave her her what Nancy Drewness. If you've ever read Nancy Drew, or if you haven't read Nancy Drew, Nancy is a the books are very Nancy is very stereotypical it's like she's very she's the picturesque daughter she's kind she's beautiful she never goes to school even though she's 18 <laughs> um, but yeah she still has friends from when she was in high school and she was wildly popular in high school like she is the image of what women were perceived to be in back then basically there is also it's, it's very interesting because Nancy was put in a lot of different situations that girls weren't really put in. Like, she was, at, while she was stereotypical, she was also very different because um, she was very straightforward and she was very headstrong and independent and that was something that wasn't really accepted. And she also knew how to do a lot of stuff, like she could, uh, she learned how to scuba dive and she could boat and she, you know, drove cars. <laughs> she did a lot of things that weren't exactly considered feminine, like, you know, like that kind of stuff. Like she, had, she was a very well-rounded human being. But it was also good because, um, those books kind of taught girls uh, how to get out of dangerous situations because even in this book there's a lot of interesting information like um, <laughs> there's stuff like how to tell if diamonds are fake but there's also stuff like this is what you should have in your car and uh, in case your car breaks down or this is what you should do if you're going out alone or if you're locked in a closet how to get out of getting locked in the closet if you're tied up and also if you get put someplace that is cold, you know what you should do. So it's kind of like if you were ever kidnapped, because she gets kidnapped pretty much almost in every single book, or some gets into some sort of dangerous situation, like I just read in the Bungalow Mystery, uh, the beginning of the book is her with her friend um, Helen, and they uh, get stuck in a storm while they're out on a boat on the lake, and they boat capsizes and she basically has to, uh, Nancy has to <laughs> take Helen and <laughs> um, swim back to shore so and they almost drown because of this and she's kind of you know telling you okay this is what you do when someone can't swim and you have to carry them to shore you know you take rest and you know just stuff like that that is very important so Nancy has gone through a lot of changes this book series went through the original book series went through the 80s, I believe. It started in the 30s, and then the original series kind of went through the 80s, and then they just kind of made a new whole generation a couple of times. And I have some of the um, new generation books. They're not as good, but... Um, I mean, they're okay, but they're not the classic Nancy type books. This one thing is called a sleuthing supply kit. Supply list. Sleuthing supply list right here, and I'm gonna read it to you so everyone can be a sleuth. <laughs> Does everyone use that word anymore, sleuth? What you should have in your purse is a magnifying glass for examining clues, notebook and pen for recording discoveries, hobby pins for picking locks, that's very useful, tweezers for removing clues from tight places, see, you never thought of that, did you? Spare change to phone for help, but that's kinda redundant, because nobody uses phone booths anymore. In your car glove compartment, you need a flashlight for night sleuthing or exploring unlit buildings, cause you know, I do. I need flashlights when I explore unlit buildings. I don't do things illegally. I promise. <laughs> Screwdriver for prying things open, cause you never know when you need to do that. You know, pry pry some loose floorboards open. A wrench handy for fixing broken boat motors and such. And such, I said and such. Might be on a boat and the motor breaks down and you just need your <laughs> your handy wrench. <laughs> I don't think that will help very much, especially if you run out of gas, but what, you know, you might need it, who knows. In the trunk of your car, you need a, ja a jack, jack 
what? <laughs> it says a jack. A jack lug wrench. No, a jack, comma, lug wrench, comma, and spare tire to make sure you reach your destination. What? What's a jack? It's not a jack lug wrench because it's a jack, comma, lug wrench. And then a spare change of clothes since you never know when you might be drenched in a rainstorm. Now that is a good idea. That one I would definitely use. This is important. From the River Heights Police Department. Mm-hmm. River Heights Police Department. That's a thing. It just says keep him talking. One technique I've learned when confronting a suspect is to keep him talking. Accusing a criminal of illegal behavior will, un will usually bring on an emotional declaration of innocence. Hmm. And the suspect will be so caught up in giving a convincing performance that he will inadvertently reveal a piece of information that proves his guilt. Hmm. So a lot sounds useful. Uh, such was the case with Mrs. Judson, aka Mrs. Emine. <laughs> when I accused her and her husband of being smugglers in front of the Brandon police chief, Mrs. Amin replied, My husband and I never stole anything in our lives, and as for smuggling jewels into this country, ha ha ha, I have never specifically mentioned jewels, and it was instantly clear to the chief that he had ample reason to keep Miss Amin in custody. Boom! You got busted. Don't steal jewels and smuggle them into the country. Hmm. What? Oh, this is interesting. During some investigations, you may need to create a replica of a clue in your possession. Hmm. <laughs> When I was working on this case, I was instructed to bring Madame Tarantella's box of letters to a drop point. Not wanting to turn them over to the criminals, I took another box instead. Some important things to remember when preparing a decoy. This is very important. Place the original item in a secure location so that the criminals can't get the evidence back. Number one. Two. Alert the police as to where and when the fake item will be left so that they can apprehend the villains when they arrive for the pickup. Mm -hmm. That's important. Even more important, create a copy that looks exactly like the original down to the tiniest detail. That sounds like a lot of work. Be sure the two items weigh the same. Well, yeah. Treat the decoy as you would the original. The, <laughs> the criminal may be observing you, so if the original is valuable or fragile, hand the decoy as if it, <laughs> as if it is as well. So <laughs> oh, hey, look, I've got a really fragile big bag here and you just fling it around everywhere. Of course you would try to act like it was fragile. Oh my goodness. If the original item is no longer in your possession, pretend that it, it is so that you can set a trap. <laughs> so I was like, basically saying, oh my gosh. It's work to make a replica and then if, if or if you don't have it, just pretend. If this is the last one's basically, if you're too lazy to make a replica, just pretend you have it. <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll believe you. Oh my god, this book. That, that's enough. <laughs> that last part, oh, that killed me. Okay. So guys, tomorrow is Monday. Uh, oh, I don't know when I'm going to post this, so... Anyway, for me, tomorrow is Monday, which means a Gotham and Houdini and Doyle, and I'm so excited. And I'll probably be live tweeting. I don't usually live tweet, but... I might do it this time, because tweeting is fun. If you want to follow me on Twitter, my link is in the description. Also, my link to my blog, JanetLeah.com, is in the description as well if you want to read about movies slash books comparisons. You know, the books, books, the books to the movie counterparts, and I compare them and show you what they did put in the movies, what they didn't put in the movies, what I like more in the books, what I didn't like in the movies, or whatever like that. I will see you guys later. I will make another video soon whenever I get another idea, and that should be soon. I was kind of thinking, um, maybe just doing purely a Houdini video because I know so much, and I was realizing as I was making, um, why you should watch Houdini and Doyle, I was <laughs> just thinking, oh my gosh, I just need to make a video about Houdini because I know so much and I want to talk about it so much, um, because he is so amazing. And his life was so amazing. It was so yeah, I'll probably do that. And I will see you guys then. Or later. Or if I get a better idea. I don't know. Bye guys. One love. One life. Signing off. <laughs> I never know how to sign off with these things. Oh my gosh. Don't steal jewels and smuggle them into the country. Hmm. <laughs>